all, I just welcome each and every one of you, and I want to thank you all for joining this. This has been a, a real desire in my heart. Um, I said before I pass on, since I'm already 90 and a half years old, before I go on to glory, I really wanted to leave a legacy behind where I could, you know, mentor and help people to disciple other people. That's a thrill of my heart. Um, and so I, I thank you that you're helping my dream come true to uh, learn how to disciple. This course is written so that what you learn, you will be able to pass on to somebody else. The ideal situation is that you get somebody that you can teach, all right? Somebody you can disciple so that each time you take in, don't wait till you take the whole course. By then you've forgotten, even though you have notes. It's as soon as you do one lesson, the best thing is you get somebody that is agreeable to let you teach them, all right? Over 50 years ago, I was teaching this course and uh, I made it a requirement. We, we were pastoring, if I'm not mistaken, the church we started, Bethel Assembly of God. And I made it a requirement. If you want to join this course, you must get a disciple uh, and um, so you can teach them. Uh, my little girl, that's Connie, <laughs> She was in primary six at the time here in Singapore, and she started begging me, please let me attend. I want to join the class. And I said, no, I said, you're a little girl. This is only for adults. They have to have uh, a disciple. -y. She said, mom, don't worry. I will get somebody to teach. You just let me join. I think she was probably really the only one that got somebody, but you know, she got three of her primary six uh, classmates, and each time she came to the class, she would go back and gather those three around her and teach them. And today, she and her husband are pastors. They've been missionaries, pastors, and they're still discipling. They use this. They've changed it to suit their church, put different names, just like VFC started off with gateway to life they turned it around into whatever was suitable for them but this is the basic thing that we started to ground people in the faith now there are 10 lessons to this gateway to life with two parts to each lesson and all of the scriptures are from old king james so if you want to be able to follow either get old king james or new king james all right, because that's what the answers will be after, all right? The first three lessons with part one and part two, which actually makes six full lessons, all right, can be taught to pre-believers. So this is a good way to get people saved is to get a pre-believer. Do you, you know, just some of the basics. You don't know too much about God. Let me just show you a few things. And then after that last lesson three, part two, that lesson offers them at the end a chance to open their heart and receive Jesus as their savior. Now, if they don't want to accept him, then you should not continue to teach because from lesson four, which is water baptism and on, it is solid grounding material to solidify a young Christian in the Lord, or even an older Christian, all right? And so um, really from lesson four, part one on, uh, it should be a truly born again believer that takes those. But these first six, they're for us as believers to know how to help somebody come to the Lord. Um, I, will I wasn't going to say it, but I am now. Way back there, maybe in 1957, I used to go door to door knocking uh, and try to witness to people. And those that were interested, I always tried to go back again. But, you know, it was like, what do I tell them this time? What? But 
So in our missionary group, which was Malaysia and Singapore together, I came up with the idea and I said, can't we have some kind of an organized question and answer, um, you know, almost like a catechism, so to speak. And um, I said, maybe each of us missionaries could write one chapter. Well, this brother Osgood, he said, no, it would be very disjointed. So he says, I will write the whole thing. And he wrote the basic, uh, the question, all right, like your first question would be the biggest fact in the world is God. What does the Bible say his name is? And the answer is, I am that I am. This is what he did. So for all 10 chapters, part two, one and two, he wrote that basic. I have over the years added all the, the meat in between. So it's become a lot longer and more um, in depth to help them better understand. All right. So this is how the course started out. It was so that I would go and be able to have something solid each time I went, knowing what I was going to speak to them and show them out of God's word. And therefore, I really believe it's a beautiful discipling uh, tactic for you to have. It's a tool. And actually, the Bible tells us, you know, we shouldn't stay immature where we're always taking in, taking in, taking in rather speaking the truth in love we should give out and the more we give out the more we ourselves begin to grow enough said there let's go over to our lesson one part one all right uh, and this lesson is god is that is the name of the lesson all right i've already told you uh the first question the biggest fact it is not a theory. It is a fact in the world is God. And what does the Bible say his name is? Now, we're going to read Exodus chapter 3. Uh, and I want you to add to your notes 13 and 14. I'm going to start out reading. But as the time goes on, I have people that are going to help me to read. And I will just call their name. And, and when I call their name, they will help me read. And that will uh, preserve my throat because sometimes the voice gives out. Uh, Exodus 3.13, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they're going to say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now that is a strange name. I am. All right. So I, I, I have added this, A and B, all right? I am, that's the ever-present one, all right? If you go back a thousand years, what was God's name? I am. Go ahead a thousand years, what will his name be? I am. He's always I am, the ever-present one, all right? Uh, that is grammatically speaking, if you want to write that down, all right? Now, I'm going to give you an extra verse here. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, all right, to go with the ever-present one. I am Alpha and Omega, which were, these were the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet, all right? The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. He has always been there. There's no time. Uh, where God was not present. He was always there. Now, another thing about this, I am that I am. I call it the unfinished name of God. I am what? I am what? And I would suggest you can write down any notes you want for yourself to remind you. I wrote this down. Whatever you have need of. 
I am whatever you have need of. All right. He has left that for you and I to fill in the blank. In fact, if you want to write under that unfinished name, put there a blank check. Now let's just play pretend for a while. All right. Uh, just say, I have a multi-million dollar father. All right. That means he has money is no problem to my father. All right. And so I come to him one day and I say, uh, Papa, I would like to buy a new home. Well, I really don't know how much they are, but let's just say two million, all right? He'll say, how much is this home you want? Oh, maybe two million, maybe two and a half million, I don't know. So he goes in his office and when he comes out, he brings two checks, one for the exact amount that I said, and the other, both of them have his name there. Both of them have my name there. But the one has the exact amount I said. And the other, he leaves it blank. And he says, take your pick. Which would you like? Now, you know, you, you could try to be very nice. Oh, of course, I take the one I said. No, it's your own father that loves you dearly. If he gave you a blank check saying, you can fill in whatever you want. If I know you, if I know me, I would take the blank check. Then I could fill it in with whatever I wanted. So this name, I am that I am, is God's blank check to you and me. That whatever our need is, we just fill it. I am your healer. I am your um, savior. I am your deliverer. Wh whatever you want to put in there. Whatever you have need of at that moment, you can fill that in and it becomes yours. Amen. Let's go to number two. What two things must we believe about God? Not, it, it, it's not, maybe you should believe. No, you must believe these two things. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Toyin to read Hebrews 11.6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right. So without faith, now please notice it's impossible. This is not knowledge. It doesn't say without knowledge. It says without faith. Faith is believing what God says. All right. And he says, if you're going to come to God, if you want to approach God, two things we must believe. Number one, he is, all right? Just that word. You'll notice on the notes, I put a bracket in God. That isn't part of the verse. I added that. So just for the answer is he is. That means he exists, that he exists. My thought is he exists as what? Is he just like another human being? Is he another, uh, you know, just the way everybody else? No, he exists as God, all right? He is, and he is God. That means he can do anything, everything, all right? No matter what circumstance that you and I are facing, all right? It tells me if he's God, he is able, all right, to hear. He is the living God who can hear you, he can talk to you, and he can answer you. That's what number two is in that verse. It says, first, we must believe he exists, that he exists as God, and that he is, not he would like to be, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So rewarder, I put there, he is willing, all right? Um, he not only is able, he not only exists, he not only can hear, all right, but he is willing. Now, how is he willing? This all has to do with he is a rewarder. How? By answering our prayer, all right? By revealing himself as our healer, our savior, our deliverer, all right, our provider, our protector, whatever you want him to be, all right? That's how, by answering 
our prayer and revealing himself to answer that prayer in whatever way it is. All right. Now, who? That means who does he reward? All right. Uh, it's not just those who pray. Please notice what that verse says. He is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. A rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's go to B. It, seek him. All right. I put there to know and to please. Let's look up the next verse, which is Psalms 14, verse 2. Toyin. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. So you see here, God is looking, all right? He looked down. That, did anybody understand the desire and the longing of God? I don't know what you think about God, but God is like you and me because he says, let's make man in our image, all right? How many of you like to have somebody that really loves you? Somebody that really understands you. Somebody that you can really pour your heart out to. Well, God made you like himself. So God himself likes that. But sometimes people don't understand that. I can remember when I was a teenager and we came back from China from being in the concentration camp and then we were on an exchange prisoner of war ship. It, it took a long time. And my mother, when we stopped in Brazil, the, the ship stopped there. Uh, this was after we had already exchanged uh, ships in Goa, India. Now we're on the Gripsholm, which is a Swedish liner that they had sent out to, to take the prisoners of war back to America. And we stopped in Brazil. And my mother got this beautiful uh, little tray. It had cotton in the bottom and beautiful iridescent butterflies of every color, uh, tur you know, turquoise, gold. I, I don't know, it was just beautiful. And they were embedded. And then of course it had a glass plate. And when she bought that, I, I said to her, mama, why are you buying that? She said, oh, I, heard my mother fell and broke her hip. And I'm planning when I get to America to serve my mother breakfast in bed. So I, oh, that's fine. But you know, when we arrived in America, in New York, uh, the telegram was waiting there. Her mother had already died. She didn't show anything in front of us. But I woke up in the night and I heard my mother sobbing in her pillow. And I said, Mama, are you crying? She was felt bad that I had like caught her crying about it. But she said, yes, I'm never going to get to serve my mother breakfast. I'll have to wait until I get to heaven to see her. And she was and at that moment, I grew up a lot. It was suddenly my mother is all she has needs. She has hers. And I suddenly realized my mother wasn't just the one to answer all my needs and take care of me. She herself had pain, sorrow of heart and so forth. And this is the way God is. Is there anyone that understands how my heart beats? Is there anyone that knows that I'm longing for their love, for their fellowship? I'm longing to pour my heart out to them. And so he looked down to see if there were any that understood, if there were any that sought God, that would seek after God. All right, Let, let's look at um, John 17, verse 3. This is life eternal, 
that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Friends, this isn't to know about him. I'm teaching you knowledge today, all right? Some of it you already know, some of it you're just being reminded of it. For others, you're going to be learning things you never knew before, all right? But I'm not talking about knowing about God, all right? Life eternal is to really know him, to be one with him, to understand his heartbeat, all right? This is life eternal, and we cannot know that till he gives us eternal life, all right? Okay, let's go on to number three. What is the true and the living God like? Now, there are four points here under number three, and we're going to read them. I'm going to read each of them, all right? Then we will go back and take them one by one and look at them in a more uh, in-depth manner, all right? The first one is, what is the true and the living God like? The Lord is good. The Lord is good. You see, there is an enemy to God. It's one of his created beings. It was, you know, uh, Lucifer, which was the uh, really full of light and full of beauty. He was the highest angelic being. And later he began to want to be like God and, you know, sin entered into his life. So Satan actually tries to paint another picture to people. And many times God, ha people have the idea God is mean. He's, uh, you know, angry. He's out to punish. He's out to destroy. They have a very warped idea. And, and that thought often comes to us. Something goes wrong. Oh, I think God is mad at me. All right. No, God is good. That's the first one. The second one is he is holy, all right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We will understand holiness a little better as we uh, teach, but let's just remember, he is not an unclean God. He is not a God that can look at sin and enjoy it and want to dabble in sin. No, no, he is a holy God. And actually, he says, without holiness, nobody's going to see him. You can't come into his presence with sin. All right. Let's look at number three. God is a spirit. All right. And under this, we're, we're going to find out the description of a spirit. A spirit has no body. All right. God is a spirit, and that's why people that want to worship him, it isn't what you do with your body that worships God. It's, he's a spirit, and we have to worship him with our spirit, all right? Which those who have never come to him, never known him, their spirits are dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sins. The last but not least is, oh, Lord, thou art our father, all right? And he is a father figure, especially to those that uh, are born again. He becomes our heavenly father, not just our God, but our heavenly father. Now let's go back to the Lord is good. And uh, Psalms 34 Verse eight, it says, read it. So, um, Toyin. Yes. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. All right. Oh, taste and see. I, I don't know about you, but uh, it from the time I was young, I enjoy food. All right. I really enjoy eating and any kind of food. I shouldn't say any kind because I've seen certain food when I look at it, I mean, ooh, I, I don't think that. And then they'll say, no, 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 just taste it. 
and you take, wow, it tastes so nice. Then you want more, then you want more. Now, this is the, don't just decide you don't believe in God. You don't want God. You don't need God. This verse says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to try him out. Try him out. Don't, don't make up your mind what he is and what he isn't till you actually invite him into your life, till you actually begin to know him and allow him to begin to fellowship with you. And then only you can decide, is he good or not good? If you've never met him, if you've never experienced him, how do you know? So this is suggesting to us, oh, taste, see for yourself, the Lord is good. Then it says happy, that blessed means happy, all right? You can write that. Happy is the man that trusts in him. It doesn't say happy is the man that believes in him. Trust is in his character. Believing in him, faith is in his ability, all right? Faith is in the ability of God, but trust is in the character of God. And so it's saying sometimes circumstances, whoa, how could God let this happen? No, happy is the person that trusts him. Like Job, even if he slays me, even if he kills me, I'm going to trust in him. I know he's a good God. He won't let anything happen that shouldn't happen, that cannot ultimately benefit me, even if it doesn't look good right now. All right, let's go to number A. We're talking about the Lord is good. Psalms 33, uh, verse 5. Uh, he loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. All right. It says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. All right. It's not just, it's in him. He has poured out his goodness. Let, let's just name a couple of things like, you know, he gives rain even when people are very wicked and bad. He lets them have air to breathe. So you, you, everything you see that is good that he's put in this earth, uh, and he lets it come to everybody. The earth is full of his goodness. You don't have to look far to see the goodness of the Lord, all right? Let, let's look at the next one. Now, this one is a long one. And I think I will do this because I'm going to, um, I'm not going to read it all. But if you read it all, all right, you'll get a lot more out of it. But I'm not going to read it all to you. This is found in Psalms 145, uh, starting with three. I will read the first one. Great is the Lord greatly to be praised and his greatness is what unsearchable if you think you know about god you have you don't begin it's going to take eternity all right to reveal his greatness to all of us all right it's unsearchable no matter how hard you want to learn to know about god you can never know everything there is about god because it's unsearchable Okay, uh, maybe I'll just keep reading. One generation shall praise thy works to another. All right, and when we start knowing him, we just want to brag on him and talk about him and tell him and shall declare your mighty acts. All right, uh, let, let's jump now down to verse seven. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy what great goodness so we see in verse seven his goodness is great and they will sing of your righteousness all right uh, he's gracious full of compassion slow to anger of great mercy nine uh, mark seven and nine the lord is good to all 
and his tender mercies are over all his works. All right. So, so I see here uh, right after that B, verse seven and nine, these two talk about his goodness. Uh, his, he's good to all. And verse seven tells us about his great goodness. It's not just ordinary goodness. It's great. All right. Um, let's go to number C. This is Moses. All right. Moses was taught. Now, one thing I want you to know about our God, he not only exists as God, uh, he made mankind that he might have fellowship with him so he could talk. You see, angels are not like God. All right. They're a creation of their own. Uh, but man is made in the image of God, in the likeness of God that would satisfy the heart of God to be able to think like him, act like him, uh, talk like him. We're made in his image, all right? He wanted to be able to fellowship and none of his other creatures that he created can he have that kind of personal fellowship. So we were made for that reason, all right? Anyways, he's here talking to Moses face to face, all right? And Moses, when he said, all right, verse 18, right there, the he is Moses. Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me your splendor. Show me your brightness. Show me your beauty. Show me your glory, all right? What does... Uh, verse 19, how does God answer that? I will make all my goodness. He doesn't say, you want to see my glory? Mm. No, 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 no. You want to see my glory and then show some of his power to destroy, to burst things apart? No. You want to see my glory? He says, I'm going to let you see all my goodness. I'll let it pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I'm gracious, and I'll show mercy to whom I want to show mercy. In other words, God is sovereign. Let's go over there to verse 5 of chapter 34. All right, this is D. Uh, Okay, I will try and read that to us. Five, six, and seven. Exodus 34, verse five, six, and seven. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Yeah. Now, when he's, he says, I'm going to do show you my goodness all right that's my glory and he names his name the the lord that is i am that i am the lord god i am that i am is god all right and then he begins to show his goodness he's full of mercy do you know what mercy is mercy is you have done wrong you have been condemned and you deserve judgment you deserve punishment but instead god gives loving kindness to you that's what mercy is loving kindness given to somebody that deserves to be punished all right so that is part of his glory he's gracious he's long suffering can suffer he puts up with a lot of nonsense for a long time all right 
abundant in goodness and truth. All right. And this mercy, he has it for thousands. He's forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. All right. This is all being offered to people that are willing to humble themselves, admit and confess and cry out that they need God. It, it's a promise. No matter what sin you have done, he says, I have mercy for you. If you're just willing to admit you have sin, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will pour out my loving kindness on you. I will change you. I will make you a new creature. All right. But what does he say? But don't take me for granted. Just because I'm loving and kind, gracious and merciful. Remember, by no means will I clear the guilty. If you are guilty and you refuse to admit it and you refuse to repent of it and you refuse to ask forgiveness and ask me to change you, don't think because I'm loving and kind, I will just wink my eye. When the day of judgment comes, you will get your just dues. Too many people take the grace of God for granted. Brother and sister, do not be guilty of that. God is gracious to us. He has forgiven us. He has washed away our sin. But don't think because he's gracious, we can go right on doing what we want to do and he'll let it go. No, no, no. He is a holy God. Don't forget that. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the second part. He's holy. All right. That, in fact, that just brings us to that. He's holy. Isaiah chapter six, it says three, but I want us to start with verse one. <clears throat> one, two, and three. This is um, the prophet Isaiah having a vision of God. Toyin? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple above it stood the seraphims each one had six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory all right. So we see here, God is a holy God. And you know, when Isaiah saw that vision, he just said, oh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people with unclean lips. All right. God cleansed him, purified him, changed him. But when you get into the presence of holy God, it's with awe. All right. Uh, I, I can't explain it. I just know that the majority of us don't understand the holiness of God. And we just take him so for granted. Don't do that. Let's go to A under holy. Um, Psalms 89 verse 14. Continue. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. All right, let, let's put it like this. God's throne, it says, is a place of justice and judgment. All right. That means um, if you come before God's throne, all right, God is going to, you know, uphold that which is right, make sure that the right is done, but the if you're bad, if you have sinned, which the Bible says all of us have sinned, everybody has sinned. So if you come like that before the throne of holy God, you will be judged like that. Huh? All you have to do in the Old Testament is look at a few of the examples that were given. When people that were trying to worship God, all right, and they had the ark, which was a representative of God and it was holy 
and it happened to be on a cart, which it shouldn't have been. Uh, it should have been carried on men's shoulders. So when these animals pulling the cart uh, stumbled and like that, the, that ark began to fall over. So this guy, you know, Uzzah, I believe his name was, he put his hand out to balance or to catch that ark so it wouldn't fall. And God smote him dead on the spot. And when we read the Old Testament, something, you know, we go, whoa, no, this, it's showing his holiness cannot entertain sin of any sort. If any one of us in our sin, which the Bible says all of us have sinned, if you come into the presence of God, you will be smitten dead on the spot. No if, ands, or buts. That's why this verse says, mercy and truth will go before God's face. God is such a good God that instead of waiting for the judgment day, when all of us appear before the judgment and we'd all be judged one after another, he sent his mercy and his truth to meet us part way. You know, my Bible tells me Jesus is the mercy of God and Jesus is the truth of God. Jesus is God, God's only begotten son, and God sent Jesus to become a human being. We meet Jesus before we ever get to the throne of judgment. And if we receive the mercy of God and we receive the truth of God, which is I'm a sinner, I deserve to die, I will die, but God is a God of love and he let Jesus that had no sin die in my place. If we receive that and say, Jesus, please forgive me, wash away my sins. Huh? Then when I approach the throne, it becomes a different throne. It's called the throne of grace. By the time the throne of judgment comes, I am covered with Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself, but the picture comes, I'm going to tell it out. I can't say how many of you understand Chinese because there's over 800 of you out there. I can't see you all, but you can all see me. But of those that do know Chinese and can understand Chinese, I'm going to explain one of the words, all right? Uh, the word for righteous is made up of two words. The first word is the word for me or I, law, all right? And if I just come before God, the way I am, the way I'm born, I just come like that. Because God is holy, God's Holy Spirit has to bring judgment on me. But God sent his son to become the lamb of God to die in my place, to be a sacrifice for me. The Chinese word for lamb is young. And if I take that radical young, all right, put it on top of me or war, the two words together means righteous. Oh, what a good God. That's what this verse means when it says, mercy and truth shall go before your face. You and I have to meet Jesus first. What we do with Jesus will tell what happens on the day of judgment, all right? If you accept God's mercy and truth, he'll cleanse you, he'll make you clean. If you say, no, I don't want Jesus, I want my own way, and you push mercy and truth out of the way, when you come into the presence of holy God, you'll just stand there without any covering and judgment will come. All right, I'm going to give you an extra verse here um, that isn't, all right, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Uh, verse Psalms 1, 4, 3, 2, verse 2. Psalms 1, 4, 3, verse 2. Toyin. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight 
shall no man living be justified. That's what I've been telling you, all right? In God's sight, no human being, all right, that is alive can be justified. Everybody has sinned. We will get that further on in our lesson, but let's take that for now, all right? Uh, let's go down to B, Proverbs 16, verse 6. Would you read that, please? Sure. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. All right, notice that. Mercy and truth go before him. Why? Because by mercy and truth, that is by Jesus, all right? Right there, by Jesus. Jesus is the mercy of God. Jesus is the truth of God, and iniquity is purged. Do you know what purge means? When in the natural we say, I'm purging, it means everything inside of us is coming out, all the dirt and all the whatever it is, it's just pouring out, pouring out until there's nothing left. And so sin is purged, totally washed away by the work of Jesus, by the mercy of God, his loving kindness, the truth of God. Yes, the truth is I'm a sinner, but the truth is Jesus loved me. God loved me so much. He sacrificed his only begotten son to take my place and bear my sin. All right, let's go now to number three. God is a spirit. All right, God is a spirit. This is number three. Shall we read that at first, Timothy? One second. Hey, wait, wait, wait. I've lost myself here. Yeah, first Timothy 1 17. Actually, um, wait. God is a spirit. The first one we want is John 4. Uh, I put 24, 23. We'll read it just that way. 24 and then 23. Okay. 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 God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Yeah. God is not looking for uh, formalities, rituals, counting beads. He's not looking for all of that. He is a spirit. And if we're really going to worship him, it has to be with our spirit. But the Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. Your body isn't dead but your spirit is dead. There's no way you can worship God with all the sin in your heart and in your life, all right? So I, I want you to put down another verse there, Luke 24, 39. I don't, maybe, um, I will just read this because I don't think I wrote it down, all right? You, you put it down there, Luke 24, 39. When Jesus came, he died, and then he arose from the dead, and when he was a resurrected Jesus, he came and revealed himself to his disciples, and his disciples, I, oh, they, they, they were frightened when they saw him because they knew that he had been dead, all right, and this is what he said in Luke 24, 39, behold, my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see, all right? For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have, all right? So we're, we're talking, I wrote that so you'll understand what a spirit is. A spirit does not have a body. <clears throat> a spirit is just a spirit. All right. And 
if that spirit shows itself as a body, you go to try to touch it, you're going to touch nothing. All right. So uh, Jesus is saying, I'm not just a spirit floating. I'm a resurrected Christ. I have a resurrected body. Notice I have hands. I have feet. I have a body. So a spirit. God does not have a body. God is a spirit. All right. And if you and I are going to worship him, we must have a spirit that is alive, a spirit that is in tune with him, a spirit that can amalgamate with him and fellowship with him because it's in spirit and in truth. Now let's read um, Toy in 1 Timothy 1.17, which is 3a. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Right. Put, put there on your, if you have your notes after 1 Timothy 1.17, this is a description of a spirit. This is a description of spirit. All right. It's eternal. It lives forever. It never dies, all right? Um, it's eternal, forever and ever. Immortal, all right? It is not mortal. What is mortal? Mortal is corrupt. It can be defiled. It can be destroyed. It can decay, uh, it, all right? But immortal is uncorruptible, all right? Um, immortal. Mortal will shriver, shrivel, wither, spoil um, by any process. So a spirit never dies, all right? We know there are good spirits and bad spirits. The good spirit that has been given life and created after the Lord, it will live forever. And all right, that's what a spirit is, all right? invisible you don't see it a spirit cannot be seen all right the only wise god god is a spirit and he is this way eternal immortal he is invisible let's go to b all right uh john 14 verse 6 jesus saith unto him I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yeah. You want to get to God the Father who is a spirit. You want to be able to worship him. Jesus said, I am the way. Yeah. Remember, God's name is I am that I am. And here Jesus says, I am. In fact, the Jews got very angry with him. Because they said, you're making yourself equal to God. Yes, he's part of I am. All right. Before he became Jesus, he was already in existence as the word. All right. But after he came down, he says, I am the way, the way to God. I am the truth. You, some things are half truth. Half, no, I am the truth. There's no if, ands, buts. There's no shady sides to me. <clears throat> There's no underlying things that are, you know, a bit. No, no, no. I am the truth. And not only the truth, I'm the life. I'm what gives you that power, that strength, that ability. But most of all, no man, circle that word no, no man can come to the Father but by me. There's no way you can approach God without me. Some people believe there are many ways. No, there is only one way. All right. Any other way is discredited by God. People can say there are many ways, but God says there's only one way. And that is through Jesus. We can come to the heavenly father. We can become a son of God. We can become a member of the family of God. Okay, um, John 3, 
verse three to six. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus sa saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, if you have notes there, you write up at the top, all right, this is talking about the second birth or the spiritual birth. Every one of us have been born the first time. That's why you're here. That's why I see you. That's why you see me. That's a physical, natural birth born of the flesh. All right. We have, but Jesus said, if, if you want to see the kingdom of God, verse, that's verse three, verse five, if you want to enter, even if you want to understand the things of the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. But if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you want to be part of it, you must be born again. All right. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit. He cannot enter. You have to, if you've never been born the first time, you'll never be able to be born a second time. There's no such a thing. But if you're born a first time, doesn't mean you automatically are born the second time. All right. One is a natural birth. The other is a spiritual birth. This Nicodemus was actually uh, one of the leaders. All right. In the Jewish uh, one of the rulers, and he didn't understand it. Your natural mind can't. Maybe some of you that are watching, there might be people have invited you to this class. You have never really accepted Jesus, and you're going to think this is kind of nonsense talking. Well, that's what Nicodemus thought. He said, "Do we, how do we go back again and get into our mother's womb? No, you don't. I told you earlier you know, when God made us, he made us body, soul, spirit, all right? Our bodies, our soul is you and me. It's your uh, mind, your thinking, your emotions, and your will. That's what makes a soul. We have a natural body so that we can express ourselves to this world. But remember, we have a spirit. But that spirit, because of sin, is dead, spiritually dead. Therefore, it cannot, all right, come into God's presence. So that spirit needs to be born again, recreated, a brand new living spirit, so that the soul through the spirit can contact God, talk with God, fellowship with God, all right? That, that's what that's saying. So it says, if you're born in the flesh, you'll always be flesh. If you're born of the spirit, that will be the realm of the spirit. You must be born again. There's no if, ands, or buts. I'm telling you, friends, some people have even prayed the prayer of salvation. They didn't mean it. They merely followed you in a prayer. They didn't mean it from their heart. They weren't crying out to God and nothing happened. They just prayed a prayer. But when it comes from the heart, they admit I'm a sinner, uh, you know, and God forgive me. I can't change myself. And Jesus, I believe you died for me. You not only died, but you arose from the dead. You're a living savior. Cleanse me, heal me. At that moment, your spirit is reborn, but it's born without any sin. The Bible says we're created a brand new creature. All right. So 
there is a saying, and I'm going to say it to you right now. Those that are born once, if you want to write this down, you can. Those that are born once, that means naturally will die twice. Those that are born twice only die once. I'm not going to explain it now. You keep coming to the classes and it will come out and you'll understand. But write it down. Those that are born once. If you don't know if you've been born a second time, you haven't. Because if you've really been born a second time, you've been born again. You know that you know and joy is in your heart. All right. If you've been born twice, you only need to die once. But if you've been born only once, that means naturally there are two deaths, the physical death and later the death at the judgment seat, which is eternal damnation forever and ever. Wow. Um, well, I don't know if I, let's finish this number four. And then we will go to the next page. We'll have a break. <clears throat> Let's finish number four. This is question number three, but uh, number four, all right. Oh Lord, thou art our father. Uh, Isaiah 64, eight, sister. But now, oh Lord, Thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter and we all are the work of thy hand. All right. Actually, this is talking about him being our creator. All of us were created by God originally. All right. We're God's creation. And in that way, uh, he is our father. He begat us. But because of sin, we were separated from him. All right, uh, so let's go to A, all right, um, Psalms 103, 13 and 14. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. All right. <clears throat> a good father, you know, it is, he pities his children. He takes big steps. They're, they're trying to run how many steps to keep up with daddy, you know? And when they start saying, daddy, I'm tired, he pities them. He doesn't say, get with it. You keep up with me. No, no, no. A good father will pick them up, realizing they're tiny, they're little, they can't do it on their own. Pick them up and then walk with them. I, I'm remembering, and this says, like as a father pitieth his children. When they ask questions, a good father doesn't say, why do you have so many questions? No, he realizes they don't have all the answers. He has more answers, so he will tell them whatever they need to know, all right? <clears throat> but it says in this verse, he pities those that fear him. This is a holy fear, all right? I'm just going to give you my um, definition of the fear of God. It isn't that, ah, ah, oh, I, I'm so afraid of you. No, 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 no. The fear of God, just write it down, is to love what God loves and hate what God hates, all right? <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little illustration. <clears throat> This came in a, I don't know if it was an article or a book. It was called In His Steps. And it showed uh, two pairs of footsteps. All right. That is Jesus and us together. We're already going on. So here's two foot, two sets of footsteps. And then suddenly, there's only one set of footsteps. 
And the person that wrote this said they cried out to God. Maybe they had a dream and they saw this. Oh, Father, oh, Jesus, why did you at this time leave me to walk alone? This was a hard time in my life. Why did you leave me to walk alone? I don't see the two steps. And Jesus said, I didn't. I picked you up in my arms. Those are my footsteps. Your footsteps aren't there anymore because I was carrying you during that time. So this is, shows how God loves us and pities us, all right? Let's go to the next one, um, Psalm 68, five and six. Okay. A father to the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Yeah. So this, this is what kind of a God and what kind of a father we have. A, a father of the fatherless. That means orphans. You don't have a father. No one to protect you. No one to provide for you. He becomes that to you. He will. This is if you're his, of course. If you're his, all right. People, that's why it says here in verse six, the rebellious. If you want to go your own way, if you, I don't believe in God. I don't want God. I want to do my own thing. Why should I listen to the Bible? Why should I go to church? Why should I? That's called rebellion. You want to go your own way. Well, you dwell in a dry land, not because God wasn't willing to be good to you and be a father to you. You chose not to have anything to do with him. But those that seek him, those that fear him, those that want to walk with him, when we don't have a father to protect us. You know, in the old days, if you were an orphan, people took advantage of you. And if you were a widow, if you didn't have a husband, oh, they took advantage of you. Yeah. But it says here, God, the father is a judge of widows. He doesn't judge the widow. He will judge those that try to take advantage of the widow. So if you don't have a husband, your husband died and left you alone. He has, you know, I was married to my husband, the one and only, all right, for 68 years. It's been almost two years since my husband left. And I, I, I will be frank with you. He was the business manager of our family. He was definitely the head of the home. And um, he made the decisions and all like that. So when he died, I wondered, will God keep supplying my needs now that my husband isn't here? But you know, he has taken care of me more than even when my husband was alive. It is amazing. I, I just can't believe what God has done, all right? This is very true. You know, he takes care of the orphan and he takes care of the widow as our father, all right? And if you're so solitary, that means you don't have anybody. You're not married, you're not, uh, you know, you're just alone. He, your heavenly father will put you into families where you have people around you. They will love you. They will care for you. They will be concerned for you, all right? And those that are bound with chains, that means habits and, um, you know, in bondage, our heavenly father will set them free. This is all if we cry to him, if we acknowledge our need of him, all right? You wanna do it on your own? No. God won't reveal himself in that way. But if you cry out, Lord, here I am. I'm like this. I really need help. I cannot do it, Lord. Will you help me? Oh, he will help you. Yes. But the rebellious, no. All right. So let's remember that. Let's go to C. 
uh, 27, Psalms 27, verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Oh, I, I love that verse. Sometimes a father and mother forsake. Forsake means they turn their back on you. But when they're dead, your father and mother, it isn't they didn't like you, but you don't have them anymore. It says the Lord will take me up. And right there, he will take responsibility. He will take responsibility for me. What a mother or a father could have done, he will take us up. This is talking to the person that reaches out, that cries out to him. He's a wonderful father. So under there on your notes, you'll notice I wrote there, God's position, our position, all right? God, as our father, is responsible for us. He's concerned for us. He provides for us. He protects us. Put one there. In other words, that is the first thing. His responsibility for us. The second one is these. We have to recognize he has the authority over us. He is the decision maker. And he has the right as our father to correct us. That's the second role of God as our heavenly father. First, the natural responsible concern, provision, protection, but position as a father, the authority, decision maker, correction maker in our life. What is our part? Number one, let's be dependent on him. That fits with the one under God, all right? Be dependent on God. Don't try to do it yourself. Two, that goes with two, his authority. Be obedient. Be obedient, all right? Um, it is now 20 past 10. Uh, we're going to take... I'm just going to say, let's take five minutes. All right. Anybody needs to go to the bathroom, uh, but come right back and we will start right in again in five minutes time. All right. Thank you. Hey, shall we come? Yeah, shall we come together again? Go to page two. What can God do? All right. Um, and right there after that, all right, uh, what can God do? Put there, he is omnipotent. Omnipotent, O-M-N-I-P-O-T-E-N-T, which equals all powerful, all powerful. All right. Uh, Job 42, 2. Okay. <clears throat> I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Yeah. God can do anything and everything. There is nothing impossible to him let's look at matthew 19 26 uh b 
But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. There it is very clearly. With human beings, there are things that are absolutely impossible, but with God, all things are possible. <clears throat> you know, there was a lady that used to uh, be with the church. I, I think she's gone on to be, uh, her name was Betty Baxter. She was born a hopeless cripple. She was born that way, a hopeless cripple, and was that way clear till she was like, 15 years old, I believe. The mother was a believer in Jesus and prayed for her every day and told her to put her hope and trust in the Lord that God could do it, didn't matter what people said, all right, even though she was born that way. And one day, Jesus spoke to her and said, on a certain day, name the day at the time in the morning, I don't know if it was 8 a.m., something like that, it, you want people to see it, you can invite your relatives, your friends, whatever, have clothes, have things there. I'm going to come and heal you at that moment. And she told there were quite a few that came out to see it. And at that exact time, she was one, when I saw her, of course, she was an older woman, but she had never again a cripple from that moment, born a hopeless cripple, and 100% healed, you could never tell there had been anything wrong with her. I'm here to tell you, our God is a God of impossibilities, all right? And so let's look here, um, Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who hath me measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span? and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Whoa, I mean, this isn't just poetry. This is literal, all right? This is the hollow of your hand. How much do you think you can put in the hollow of your hand? I, I doubt if I could even put a quarter of a cup to tell you the truth. Definitely not a third of a cup or a half of a cup a water in the hollow of my hand. God's hand is so big that he can put all the rivers, all the lakes, all the oceans in the whole world in the hollow of his hand and hold them all. This is just to give you a little idea of how big God is. You know, I put there and it says that this is the span of a hand from the thumb to the little finger. He can do the horizon from one end of the horizon to the other end, the span of his hand. That, that's how big God is. On my paper, I put there a negative and a positive, all right? A negative is, I wouldn't want that big hand to spank me. Phew. I mean, no. You, every bone in your body would be broken if he used that big hand and gave you one tight wallop. If he hit you on the head like some human parents do, give you a bash on the head, you wouldn't have a skull left, all right? That's the negative. I don't want that kind of a hand punishing me. But the positive is, whoa, that big of a hand if he wants to bless me, if he wants to pick me up, he wants to hide me, he wants to hold me. Oh, what a marvelous thing. All right. Um, it, it says, look at he, mountains. God's scales are so big. He can literally weigh the mountains in his scale. It's just to give you a little idea of how big God is is all right let's look at the next one job 23 verse 6 will he plead against me with his great power no but he but he would put strength in me all right so uh, will he use his power against me 
Yes, he's big. Yes, he's strong. Is he going to threaten me? Is he going to bully me? No, no, no. Oh, it says he will put his strength in me. It's like a father that has a newborn baby or maybe even a, um, a few months old baby. <laughs> when, when that baby starts crying, does he... Listen, if you don't shut up, no, 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 no. A father's heart will pick that baby up. My, my husband had the best father's heart. When the kids would cry in the night, he was the one that would get up and he would take, I don't know what he would do. He'd put their head right here under his arm. And in a few minutes, they were, and then he'd put them back. Oh, my husband was the best father when those kids were tiny to know how to quiet them down and, and like that. And that, that's the way God is. No, Job says, is he going to take that strength and bash me up? No, he's going to use it to help me, to strengthen me, to lift me up, to enable me. All right. Um, the next one is Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Yeah, that, that in itself tells you exactly that. You know, when you're faint, when you're ready to give up, he's there to strengthen you, to put power and strength in you. When you have no might, he will increase your strength. Go ahead. Even the youths shall fail and be wary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Especially in the spiritual realm. Even youths start giving up. Even the young people don't have the stamina on their own. Just because they're young. In the realm of the spirit, my friends, we need God, all right? And there are times even young people want to give up, throw in the sponge. There's been many young people in the recent years that have committed suicide. Just because people are young doesn't mean that they've got all that it takes. But it says those that wait on the Lord, not just wait, wait, wait. Dung, dung, dung. That's the Chinese word for uh, not that kind of a weight, but to minister to him, that look to him, that are drawing from him. All right. Their strength is renewed. Oh, I can tell you as a 90 year old, sometimes this body just says it's ready to quit and give up and shake. And, you know, and I'll just get on my bed and cry to the Lord. And this morning I did it. And as I'm crying to the Lord, suddenly I started laughing. And I began to laugh. And I knew I was in the presence of the Lord. Because the Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. No reason to laugh. I just started laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. And I felt strong when I finished. Because God had renewed the strength. The body wants to give out sometimes. Whether you're young or old. All right, but as we cry out to him, our God is able to minister to us and help us not to give up and faint. Okay, let's go. What does God know? He is omniscient, right? That word, O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-T, omniscient. All right, that means he knows everything. Let's read that, Hebrews 4. 12 and 13, right? The number 12. Okay. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But things are naked and open unto his eyes, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Yeah. 
Now, mine says, but all things are naked and open heart. There's not even any creature that's not manifest. You can't hide yourself from God. You can't lock yourself away where God can't get at you. I am here to tell you, God can do the impossible. He knows everything that is going on. He has an answer for everything, all right? And it says God's word. And who is God's word? Jesus is the word of God. He was the word of God before he became Jesus. And now he is the living word of God. He is alive. He is powerful. He's sharper than any two-edged sword. When he speaks, his word can just come in and just divide between what is of you and what is of God. He can even know your thoughts afar off, all right? So I've told you under there, naked, uncovered, opened is unlocked, all right? Um, nowadays, we have these doors that are, you know, you have locks that uh, if you have the right key, that the door opens itself. But in Bible days, they didn't have those kinds. And remember with Peter, when he was in prison and he was chained to four quartarians of soldiers, he was tied down in locks and chains. And in the night, the angel came and smote him and said, follow me, get up, get dressed, all right? And the, the chains just dropped. Our God knows everything and he can do anything and everything. All right. With that Hebrews above it, put there um, Psalms 32, verse eight and nine. Okay. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and brittle, lest they come near unto thee. Yeah, what this is telling us is God knows everything. He has an answer to everything. And if we will just allow him, because God gave you a free will, he will never force you to do anything. He made you like himself with a free will. You have a choice. Even after accepting Jesus, you have a choice. He never takes away your free will, but he's made a promise. He says, you know what? I will instruct you. I will teach you. I will guide you with my eye. You know, <laughs> I had five children. And when we would be invited to go eat someplace, uh, five little kids are quite a handful and I can only sit by one or maybe at the most two. There's three somewhere else. And so, you know, when I read this, I, I, I said to the Lord, but Lord, I can't see your eye. Because what I would do is if one of them acted up, if they were, wouldn't look at me, I would get a hold of one of the other kids to get them. Look at mama. And then my eye was an evil eye. I would say, you, they looked at me and it was like, you wait till you get home. Boy, you're chung, chung, chung. I'm going to spank you. I, I could say all that, just the look I gave them. But that isn't what he's talking about here. When I said, but I can't see your eye, he said, I didn't ask you to. I can see what you can't see. And I will warn you. I will tell you of things that are going to happen. I will say, don't go down this road. Do go down this road because I see beyond what you can see. So when he says, don't be like the horse or the mule, you know, we put those uh, things in their mouth. Uh, what do you call them? Is it the rain? Uh, and it's metal. And then we pull. And because it hurts their mouth, they'll go that direction. Okay, you want them to stop, you pull both. Oh, they, they, they stop or their mouth gets cut. So don't be like that, where I have to hurt you to make you hear me. I want to help you in your life. I want to direct you, lead you, guide you. 
You know, my mother, when she was in China, I was before we were born, she was married to my father and they were going to the inner part of China for a special meeting, not knowing my father was going to get sick. And he got very sick. In fact, he had uh, smallpox, which is very dangerous. By the time they arrived at the place, he was totally delirious in this high fever. So the missionaries found a, a vacant um, idol temple on a mountain that wasn't being used anymore and managed to put my mother and father there and put a mattress and whatnot uh, so that he wouldn't be able to pass this sickness to anybody else, all right? He was totally out of it and it was the middle of the night and it was winter time and the winds were howling outside. The snow had come down and in the middle of the night, my mother heard somebody knocking on the door of that idol temple and everything in her, she started to get up. God said, do not open that door three times. And finally she settled down. She said, I feel so terrible, God, but I know your voice. You're telling me don't open. So I'm not going to open, but I, I just feel sorry for whoever's out in that storm. But early in the morning, she heard the voice of the missionaries as they came up that mountain and crying, are you all right? Are you okay? And she, of course, got up, opened the door and they said there was a leopard prowling around. And in the, the snow, you could see the pug marks of that leopard. He had come and sat there and his tail dum, 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 was banging on the door. It was a leopard that she thought was a human being knocking on the door. God could have said there's a leopard, but you see, he wants to teach us to obey him. And he just said, don't go. That's the, that's the beauty of being a child of God. He takes oversight over our life. Had she opened that door, I wouldn't be here teaching you today because my mother wouldn't have been alive to give birth to me. Yeah. So let's move on here. Um, yeah. Psalm 147, this is C. His understanding is infinite. Shall we read that? Three to five. Yes. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his understanding is infinite. Well, his understand it doesn't say his knowledge is infinite. That is under, his knowledge is infinite. But this is his understanding. To know something, to really understand it with the heart, our God is not just knowledgeable, he is understanding as well. Can you know, do you know how many stars there are? <laughs> it says they're without number, but he knows exactly how many stars there are. Hey, I had five children and, and I couldn't remember their names. I, I'd get their names mixed up and sometimes run through the five gamblet before I, I arrived at the right name. Our God is great. All right. The next one. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs on your, of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. A sparrow is one of the most common birds. And it says, if, you know, two uh, sparrows sold for a farthing, if just one falls, God knows it. One sparrow's gone. He knows it. You say, well, what's great? Hey, when it says even your hairs, how, you know, we're very precious to ourselves. When you drop hair, do you know how many hairs drop every day? 
Do you know that every day the number of your hairs on your head are a different number? Huh? And as precious as you are to yourself, you think you know all about yourself. Do you keep track of how many hairs fall out? How many new hairs grow in every day? The number changes every day. And how many people in the whole world and yet individually he knows how many hairs are on your head. If he, you say, so what? That means something that has seemingly no value yet he knows it about you. Don't you think the things that are worthy and valuable and important doesn't he know about that as well? All right. So uh, let's go here to Isaiah 40, 13 and 14. I'm going to read that. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them. We read this before. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. All right. Um, I don't know why I put that one there. That was an extra one, but we've already had it. So you, let's just go to the very next one. E, Isaiah 40, 13 and 14. It is, I said, oh, sorry, Isaiah 40, verse 12, 13 and 14. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? or being his counselor hath taught him. With whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding. You know, when you see a person that's really smart, really brilliant, you know, what school did you go to? Who was your professor? So you say, when you say that about God, no, no one. The answer is no one taught him. This is innate in him. The, he's the, always been this way. That's what makes him different than us. He is God, all right? Who instructed him? No one instructed him. 40, 25 to um, 28. Isaiah 40, verse 22 to 28. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitant thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a, curt, a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Okay, stop just a minute. Do you know just maybe a couple of hundred years ago, people thought the earth was square? Yet this was written so long ago, Isaiah, 700 before years before Jesus ever came to the world. And it already talks about he that sitteth on the circle of the earth because God created it. He knew it was circular and it took man uh, hundreds of years to figure that one out. All right, continue uh, 25. Yes. To whom then? Will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who has created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one falleth. Verse 27, why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. Yeah, no searching of his understanding, not just his knowledge, but to understand the depth, the pain, the agony, the sorrow, the severity of whatever that situation is. He is the Lord 
the everlasting God. He's the one that created the heavens and the earth. Don't think that your way can be hid. Don't think that you can do something and he doesn't know about it. He knows everything that's going on. Let's go to number six. Where is God? All right. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, verse 23. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can, any hide, yes, can mm -hmm. any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? All right, now, where is God? Uh, by that one put there, he is the all-present one or um, omnipresent. That means all-present one, wherever it is. Notice this when it says, do not I fill heaven and earth. I want you to think for a moment. How many of us, when we sit in a chair, we pretty much fill that chair, all right? But do we fill the room? No. <laughs> if I'm in the chair, I'm not over there. If I'm here, I'm not there. But God not only is in heaven and on earth, but he fills it. That means you can't go anywhere to get away from the presence of God. God is there. Oh, how marvelous. I still remember when our car was going to it hit an oil slick and it, and these big semi trucks were coming and it was going to you know go right under the wheels and i just screamed i had no time to pray my husband was driving but he, he had lost control and the car spin and then it went straight for the wheels of this semi truck and i just remember screaming jesus as loud as I could scream, I was terrified. And a pair of arms, but we never saw it, but we felt it like arms. I just took our car just before it went under, grabbed it, went, mm, 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 and these trucks just passed us, and, and our car went straight. Oh, out in the boonies, out in the no man's land, on that narrow little road. But when I cried, Jesus, he was there and he saved our lives. Amen. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is everywhere. Where is God? He's everywhere. Does God see me? Um, Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Yeah. They're everywhere. He sees the good. He sees the bad and he makes note of it and he knows. All right. It's not like us. After a year or two, we forget even certain things. We just forget. No, no, no. He knows everything. I want you to put down there Psalms 94. Psalms 94. All right. Um, from seven to 13. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? Stop a minute. By fools, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, he might not say it with his mouth, in his heart, there is no God. So when he calls people... You act like there's no God. You behave like there's no God. You think you talk as if there's no God. You're actually a fool in his sight. Continue. He that planted the earth, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth, chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know the lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth 
O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Yeah, th thank God that he's willing to teach us, all right? Uh, we, we have quite a few here. You know, I might carry on. Uh, I don't want to stop. I'm, I'm going to finish this. Those of you that can stick with it, you stick. If you have to go, you, you may go, all right? But I want to finish this chat. I'm too close to stopping now. Uh, let's go over there to, does God see me? Um, Psalms 139. We're not going to read uh, all of that. Um, it says here, you know my down, you have searched me and known me. You know my down sitting, my uprising, all right? Uh, you compass my path or my walk, my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but you know it all together. In other words, you know the reason, you know the motive, you know the impact it's going to make. You've beset me behind and before, all right? Let's jump down to verse seven. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee or run away from your presence? You cannot. I don't care where you go, what you try to do. God is watching. God is seeing. If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I go down into hell, the lowest part of the earth, there you are. All right. If I take the wings of the morning and go to the uttermost part of the sea. Even there, your hand is there. Your right hand is there. Even the darkness, all right, verse 11. Surely the darkness shall cover me, but the, no. You know, to God, there's no night or day. We can't see because we don't have a light, but God is light. So even if it's the pitchest darkness, he can see you. He knows what's going on, all right? And it says here, they're both alike to him. All right. Let's look at Psalms 139, 23 and 24. Uh, sister. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Yeah. So that see if there, he's really saying, show me. If you see something are wrong in me, some wicked way in me, uh, please take leadership, take directorship, please guide me. I don't know everything about myself, but God knows everything and he can show you if you really want to know. All right. Sometimes we don't like to know. Uh, I remember this one time that I went to God about a person that had come into my life and they were coming quite often and wanting to stay at my house. And um, I kind of got tired of it. And I just said, God, why did you let them come into my life? Uh, you know, if, if I do this, it's poor me. If I would do the other thing, she would say, it's poor me. I, I said, I just can't take it anymore. Instead of God saying, you poor thing, he said, you're looking at yourself. <laughs> Whoa, I got a shock. What do you mean I'm looking at myself? You, you're complaining and fault finding about her, but you behave the very same way, God said. And the minute I heard that, I thought, oh my goodness, my poor husband, what he's had to put up with all these years. No, I don't believe I'm like that. So I went to my husband and I said, dad, I'm going to ask you a question. You tell me the truth. And he he knew something was coming. I tell me the truth. Now, don't beat around the bush. Am I like this? And I explained the scenario. And he just got this funny smile on his face. I said, just tell me, am I like that? And he nodded his head. And then I got mad at him. Why didn't you tell me before? <laughs> he said, would you have believed it? God told you and you don't want to believe it. Would you have believed it if I tried to tell you? No, God knows our failings and our faults. And when he tells us, all right, then we, we need to surrender to him and let him change us. Okay, 
where are we now? Um, search me, C, sister. Yes, Job 23, verse eight. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Mm. Job understood this, all right. Uh, on our part, we can't see him. We can't understand what's going on, but don't judge God by our capabilities. He far exceeds us. And even though we can't see him, he can see us. Even though we don't understand, he very well understands. And if we belong to him, he will cause these bad things to work out. It says, uh, after he's tried me, I will come forth as gold. Okay, let's go to number eight in the beginning. What did God do? In the beginning, we're not going to read this. Uh, it's right there, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I ask the question, how? All right, how? By the word of his authority. These verses will show us that, all right? The first one, Hebrews 11, 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. All right. Of course, if you don't, if you haven't believed in God, you might believe in evolution and all the rest of it. But I'm here to tell you that God is so great. All he had to do was speak the word of his authority. Let there be. And it was out of nothing. He created things. He didn't use what already was there out of nothing. He spoke them into existence all right the, by the wor worlds the worlds were framed by his voice let's or mouth or word hebrews 1 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Yeah, so this is of course Jesus is talking, but Jesus is the word of God, all right? Not only did he create them, but he is sustaining them, upholding them, keeping them in their proper orbit. You know, if our world, if the sun came a bit closer, it would burn us up. If it moved a bit further away, we would all freeze to death. But it's the, and it's not, you know, hooked up to some. He's saying, hang there in the right proportion. You stay there and you don't move till I tell you you can move. Woo, 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 woo. I tell you he has power and authority. All right. Uh, verse, Psalms 148, verse 5. It says he commanded, all right, let them praise the name of the Lord. Why? For he commanded and they were created. The word of God is so powerful. We need to start recognizing this God that we serve is a great God. Whether you serve him or whether you don't, there is a God and he is a great God, all right? And we need to recognize his greatness and his ability uh the the next one is 33 all right psalm 33 verse 6 by the word of the lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth he gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap he layeth up the depth in storehouses let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake 
and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Yeah. Actually, there's a verse that we didn't read, number four, uh, earlier. It says, for the word of the Lord is right. All right, that uh, Psalms 33 is a marvelous telling us how great his word is. Let, let's leave that be and let's go now to number nine. Is God different from an idol? All right. And I'm going to read to you what's on our paper. It says, we ought not to think that the Godhead is the Godhead, meaning God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. There's, there are three separate persons, but they're all one Godhead. Don't compare them to gold, silver, stone, graven by man's device. Would you read for us Acts 17, 24 uh, to 31? Okay. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. All right, Let, let's not think just because we go to a church, we go to a temple that that we can worship. No, no, no. He doesn't live. The true and the living God doesn't live in something that man's hands made. Okay. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his off offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. All right, now I'm going to ask you, and you can write this down if you want. All right, uh, make a comparison. Who makes the idol, an idol, who makes it? The answer is man. Now, who is greater, the one, the idol or the man? You made that thing. So you're greater than that thing, right? Who made man? God made man. So who's greater, all right? God is greater than man. Man is greater than the idol. Hey. Don't even try to compare God with an idol. Huh? God is way up there compared to an idol. Notice on your notes here on page two, graven by art. That means man's work, all right? Man's device. It came out of man's mind. Uh, his, his thinking, his ingenious, all right? Um, Isaiah 40, verse 18 to 21. Okay. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told to, to you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. How, how are you, you want to make an idol? How can you make anything that depicts how big God is? Remember, we talked about the hand, how big it is. You can't make something that big. 
So no matter what you try to make that depicts God, that's supposed to be your God, uh, it cannot begin to compare. Just like in India, when we were invited to go to this uh, home, they had uh, the little child Jesus, and it was a little statue. He had a crown, he had a gold, uh, not gold, but purple, and this, you know, when I looked at it, I thought, that's their Jesus. They can move it around, they can throw it, they can bash it around. No, no, no. If you, there's nothing, that's why God forbid us to make any kind of a, a likeness because he is too big for anybody to try to make a likeness that will let you realize how big he is. But he's willing to talk to us. He's willing to share with us. He's willing to communicate with us. But he said, don't try to make something where you have something to look at. Because no matter what you make, it, it, it cannot compare. And you're going to, your idea of God is going to be diminished immediately. All right. Um, let's do Psalms 135. Psalm 135, verse 15. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Okay, now let's see this. They have mouths, they can't speak. Eyes can't see, ears. All right, no breath in them. What are they? They're dead. Just put there, they're dead. And that's why spiritually they are dead. They're a dead object. So it says people that make idols, they also are spiritually dead. They don't understand. God is not like that. God has eyes that can see, ears that can hear, a mouth that can speak. All right. And everyone that trusteth in idols are spiritually dead dead all right um psalms 115 this is more or less saying the same thing i'm, I'm going to read it wherefore should the heathen say where is now their god the heathen want something because they're spiritually dead they don't understand how big and great god is so they make this thing to look at and because we don't have something that we put there to look at all right they say where is their God? Our God is invisible. That's where he is. Our God's in the heavens. But that doesn't mean he's not there. He's very much alive. He's done whatever he wants. Four to eight. All right. Their gods are silver, gold, the work of men's hands. And, and it says the same thing. From four to eight, just put there, they are spiritually dead. All right. Let's go to the next one. Isaiah 44, all right, and I think I better do this. It's a very long portion. Okay. They that make a graven in image, all of them are vanity. That means emptiness, all right? Their delectable things shall not pros profit. They are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. So it's saying that an idol is dead. Who has formed a God, all right, or a molten image that is profitable for nothing? All his fellows shall be ashamed. The workmen, all right, they're gathered together. Let them stand up, yet they shall be afraid. They shall be ashamed together. All right, I, I want us to go out. Let, let's start here with verse 14. He hews him down cedars. This is talking about the heathen. They cut down a big cedar tree. They take the cypress, the oak, and they strengthen it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants an ash and the rain nourisheth it. 
it shall be for a man to burn. All right. I, I'm going to sum this up from verse 15 to 17. All right. Everything that they do is self-centered. It's for self. It's for what they want. All right. It says that he takes part of that wood and he burns it. All right. So that he can make bake some bread. All right. Uh, he, he does part of it uh, so that he can roast a roast and be satisfied so he can get keep warm. But the residue, that's verse 17, the leftover, when he's everything for himself, he has, what am I going to do with this? Okay, I'll make a God out of it. And then he falls down and he worships it and says, deliver me, you're my God. When, when you see it from God's vantage point, idolatry is totally self-centered. It's all based on what can I get out of it. Actually, God wants us to come to know him. And when we take him as Lord, Savior, as our master, it's what God wants for us. It's not what we want for ourselves. All right. Let's look at verse 18. They have not known. They don't understand because God shut their eyes. They cannot see. They cannot understand. No one considers. There's neither is there knowledge. This is verse 19, nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. In fact, you could just take 18 through 20. You don't have to read all of this other. Just take those last three verses and it will kind of give you the whole substance. I've roasted the flesh. I've uh, eaten it. And now shall I make the residue, the leftover, an abomination? That's another word for something God hates. That's an idol, an hateful thing. Shall I fall down to the stalk of a tree? And it tells why a person would do that. He feedeth on ashes. There's nothing spiritually uh, beneficial at all in idolatry. You're eating on nothing that's, it's just been burnt up and just the ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside. He cannot deliver his soul. All right. So this is the reason under F totally deceived by the enemy. That's why they turn to idolatry. And yet many people in the world don't go and tell them that. I'm just telling you, this is the way God sees it. All right. God is alive. God is real. God is a person. God is living. He can see, hear, feel, touch, impart, give. He can be hurt. He can be grieved. He made us like himself. So I think that's about all for today. I'm going to close it here. And uh, next week's Wednesday, you come and we will do part two, which if I'm not mistaken, is about creation. All right. Um, yeah. I hope you learned something today. I've kept you 15 minutes longer. God bless each and every one of you.